Good evening, sports fans, and welcome to the 37th Annual Sports Hall of Fame Enshrinement Banquet. If you had an occasion to look through your program, under the heading of Master of Ceremonies, it indicates Joe Tate or I'm the or. I just want to say in all sincerity, a great big thank you to King James and his Cavaliers for making this opportunity possible for me. For the past many years, I either sat on that far side or that far side waiting to see the whites of Joe Tate's eyes indulging in that free dinner that the Sports Hall of Fame committee gave me each year and each time the guilt complex kept getting larger and larger. I'm just gratified that tonight I'll have an opportunity to earn my keep. Just a couple of reminders, there is no intermission. The bar will be open during the dinner hour only. Once the program starts, the bar will be closed it will, however, reopen after the program is completed. So if you want to hang around and socialize, the opportunity will be there for you to do that. For those of you, by the way, that came expecting to see Joe Tate, there will be no refund. He boarded the plane at 2 o'clock this afternoon along with the Cavaliers heading for Washington for the big game tomorrow night. Just out of curiosity, how many of you stayed awake until the very end last night? Kind of a boring game, wasn't it? <laughs> all right, let's get the show underway, and I'm going to invite you all to stand for the singing of our national anthem as sung by Marlene Karpinski. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet or the land of the free and the home of the brave. It is my uh, pleasure at this time to introduce to you the president of the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame Committee, Bill Stow. Thank you, Ron. Glad to see you could make it this time. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 37th Annual Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame Enshrinement Banquet. Over the years, over the years, Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame has recognized individuals at the local, the state, and the national level who have achieved excellence in sports. Among those that have been inducted have been people who have played in the NFL, Major League Baseball players, a high school basketball championship, and several Final Four finishes, Sandlot teams in both baseball and softball, who have earned state and national titles. 
The list goes on and on. There have been awards for high school athletics, high school awards at every level. Same is true of at the collegiate level. People coming out of Lorraine have been conference all-stars and even all-Americans. So it's a proud tradition that we have going here in Lorraine. And of course, not the least of which are all of the coaches and administrators who have enabled all of these athletes to do their thing. We're trying to carry out the principles which were established when the committee was, immediate, was established back in 1970. At that time, our objective was and still remains to recognize the most outstanding players in athletics who have been nominated by you, the general public. We look for your entries. If you have someone in mind that you think would be a good candidate for Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame, by all means, fill out an application and get in touch with one of the committee members. Before we proceed any further, let me introduce the people at the front table. We have Reverend John Newby, pastor, Greater St. Matthew AME Church in Lorraine. <laughs> Mayor Craig Fulton and his wife Karen. Karen Adelman, one of my six daughters, sitting in for my wife, Carolyn. Bob DiBiasio, our speaker this evening. We're looking forward to that. And of course, our MC, Ron Bacalar. At this time, I would like to introduce to you the inductees for this year's class. I'll introduce the inductee and uh, whoever is with them, and I would ask them to stand, and I would ask you then to hold your applause, if you would, until they have all been recognized. Starting out with recognition of Louis Fasco, represented by her, his daughter, Patricia Flowers, and accompanied by her husband, Jesse. Raymond Harris. Larry Olawinski and his wife, Dee. Virgil Williams and his wife, Mary. Paul Wilson and his wife, Delora. Reese Morgan and his wife, Joe. William Tippy, and in the team category, the 1959 Clearview football team. Ladies and gentlemen, please. <laughs> Bob Livcheck, how can I overlook you? Uh, I, I'll make it up. I'll be on practice tomorrow. Amy, I'm very sorry. <laughs> please stand. Does everybody stand? Representing the Clearview football team is Coach Paul Amadio and Captain John McCaslin. Ron, I'll turn it back to you. At this time, I would like to have uh, the Reverend John Newby, pastor of the Greater St. Matthew AME Church, Lorraine, to come up for the invocation. May we bow our heads. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to today exclaiming that you are God and greatly to be praised. There is none other beside you. Glory to your name. God, we have gathered here this evening to celebrate your goodness and to recognize some of our own who are examples of the best in athletic tradition. We thank you, O oh Heavenly Father, for the sports heritage of this great city, the international city. And we ask you, O oh God, this day that you would bless each of us who have come here to relish in the achievements and the accomplishments of some of your people. We ask, O oh Heavenly Father, that you would bless the food that we're about to receive to nourish and strengthen our bodies so that we may become stronger and better able to do your will. These blessings we ask in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Let's eat. Okay, let's be seated and get the show on the road. It is my pleasure at this time to introduce to you and bring forward the Honorable Craig Fulton, Mayor of the City of Lorraine. Thank you, everybody. It's always a great honor to be here at this event. You know, Lorraine, we're a great sports town, and everybody knows that about Lorraine. And th <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you know, that's why being inducted to the Hall of Fame is that much more of an honor than being a sports hero in some other communities. Because if you're the best of the best in Lorraine, no one can beat you. And uh, that's... <laughs> That's why I really congratulate all the inductees here tonight. You know, it's a great honor to be in this Hall of Fame, and I always like giving a plug to the committee. If there is certainly a community service Hall of Fame, all, all the, the Sports Hall of Fame committee would be in it, because it's not just this that they're involved in. I see their faces at all the events throughout the year and helping out the community, and those are the things that make Lorraine such a great place to live. So. Congrats to everybody, and thank you to the committee for making this such a great event. Thank you, Mayor. And speaking about the Hall of Fame, uh, Lorraine is not the only community in Lorraine County with a Hall of Fame. There is also a Hall of Fame in Elyria, and some of its members are present. We'd like to have them stand and be recognized, members of the Elyria Sports Hall of Fame Committee. I'd like to now take this opportunity to introduce to you the members of the media and some other uh, fine folks. First of all, from the Morning Journal, sports editor Eric Stossel. From the Illyria Chronicle Telegram Sports Department, Bill Weisbrod. Retired from the Morning Journal Sports, Hank Kozlowski. Retired from the Cleveland Plain Dealer Sports, Paul Bumgartner. From Radio WEOL, Jim Allen. Also from radio station WEOL and Lorain County's finest play-by-play -play radio announcer, Tim Alcorn. I could say that because the other radio stations aren't here. <laughs> Last and certainly not least, from TV20 WLCS, my boss, Joe Bach. Just out of curiosity, I know this is not in the script, so you have to indulge me. How many of you do watch uh, the sporting events on WLCS TV 20? Uh, if you live in the city of Lorraine and have cable television, it's on channel 20. In the fall, we do football and volleyball. In the winter, we do basketball, freshman, JV, varsity, boys and girls, and wrestling. And this coming weekend on TV20, another first, you're going to see a softball game between the Lady Admirals in Shaker Heights. The Lady Admirals are undefeated in the LEL. Uh, Joe, by the way, uh, managed to fit in 43 sporting events during the winter season. There is no other educational television station in the state of Ohio that can come close to doing what that man has been doing. And. Uh, we salute him for that. <laughs> like to uh, introduce and have stand now the past enshrinees in the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, we request that they stand and be recognized.
Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker, Bob DiBiasso. DiBiasio is entering his 27th year with the Cleveland Indians and currently is the Vice President of Public Relations. He has degrees in journalism and education and has been a sports editor and sports broadcaster. He is a highly visible spokesman for the Indians and like many of us has suffered during the not so good years and enjoyed the tremendous success of re recent seasons. So without further ado, I am pleased to present this evening's guest speaker, Mr. Bob DiBiasio. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate it. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I did call Joe Tate uh, prior to him catching that 2 o'clock flight to uh, D.C., and the first thing he said to me was, make sure you acknowledge Rosie in the audience. <laughs> well, I didn't have to because I'm walking back to get a Diet Coke during dinner, and on the way back I see Mayor Alex there and saying hello, and this young lady turns to me and says, who are you? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm Bob DiBiasio, the PR man of the Cleveland Indians. And she goes, nice game today. What are you going to do about that pitching? <laughs> you know, we lost 12 to 2. At least when I walked out of the car and walked in here, we were losing 12 to 2. And so it was a little payback from our uh, game against Oakland last night. Uh, it reminds me of a, a statement my son, who's a freshman, in high school keeps telling me that uh, sometimes you're the windshield and sometimes you're the bug and today we were the bug. So also I have to acknowledge Hank uh, myself. 28 years ago uh, I was a PR man for the Cleveland Indians. I spent one year at the Atlanta Braves. I'm a local kid. I grew up in Lakewood in the old LEL and always thought coming to Admiral King for the basketball tournaments was the greatest experience in the world, played for Lakewood High and played on that court in a uh, uh, sectional tournament. Um, when I started at 23 years old as PR man for the Cleveland Indians, Hank took me under his wing and uh, publicly need to thank you for that, Hank. Uh, really appreciate it. I also would like to congratulate everybody up here on their tremendous honors, uh, the deserving athletes, uh, those who have been uh, honored and those who will be honored tonight. Uh, tonight is a celebration of athletic achievement, but it is also a celebration of the importance of sports and the life lessons that sports provides. We learn success, we learn failure, we learn about cooperation, we learn about teamwork, and we learn about discipline, and we learn about competition which is not a negative word. There's a lot of good that comes from one's participation in sports, and we celebrate that this evening. I was honored to be asked to be here tonight after I received a program from a year ago and saw the incredible list of past speakers. And I noticed that Sharon Hargrove was on that list, an old friend, dear friend, I'm sure she was incredible when she was here. She is an incredible lady. Uh, and it brings me and reminded me of one of my uh, most favorite stories that I would love to share with you. And it deals with her husband and her son, Andy. So we need to turn the clock back to 1994, opening day at Jacobs Field. An incredible day in the history of our franchise. Probably the most significant day in our franchise because the building of Jacobs Field is the one single thing that in modern day baseball provided us the opportunity to have the economic stability to be a competitive franchise. On that day, if you remember, Bill Clinton was throwing out the first pitch. In a meeting with the White House advance team in the Secret Service the night before the opener, we sat in a room, a conference room at Jacobs Field and the young lady who was in charge of the advance team turned to me and said, Bobby, please explain to me what this first pitch is all about. And I said, well, her name was Rose. I said, Rose, we are going to have a young lady dressed in a blue suit, white blouse, red, white, and blue scarf, escort the president out to pitcher's mound. And she looked at me and she goes, no, 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 no. 
we won't have a young lady escorting the president out <laughs> to pitch her smile. A little later we figured out why she said that, but um, she turns to me and she says, you are going to escort the president out to pitcher's mound to throw out the first pitch. And I thought, you know, this would be an incredible honor again. Local kid, great day for the franchise. You know, I voted for the guy, so I said, what the heck, this will be an incredible honor. So the day comes of the game, and I have one of those special pins on that the Secret Serv Service lets you get into different places when you have that pin on. So I meet the President of the United States underneath our dugout. We have four batting cages, so guys can sneak in there if they're going to pinch hit. They can go in and warm up off a pitching machine, or if they know they're going to go in and play defense, they can throw a little bit. Uh, there are four cages right behind our dugout. That was the holding cell for the President of the United States. So I go up and introduce myself, and we're chatting, and he turns to me. I said, is everything okay, sir? Anything I can do for you? And he says, well, you know what? I'm nervous. And I said, and he said, I don't want to bounce the ball in a home plate. I'm going to get booed. And I thought to myself, hell, you're going to get booed by half the people in this place anyway. <laughs> that's just the life of a politician, right, Mayor? That's just the way it goes. So I said, hey, you want to play catch? And he goes, yeah, you know, that would get my nerves calm. I'd love to play catch. So we're in there, and, and Bill Clinton is a very imposing man, very tall. Obviously, I know this sounds odd, but he is incredibly presidential. I mean, very imposing man. So we're in the batting cage playing, or about to play catch. And I turn, again, being a PR guy, our job is brown nosing, that's all we do. <laughs> and the guy I need to brown nose 365 days of the year is the manager of our baseball team uh, because I'm asking things of him every day of the year. So I turn and I see Andy Hargrove in a baseball uniform. He was out shagging flies earlier. So I turned to Andy, who's 15 years old, and I said, Andy, how would you love to play catch with the President of the United States? And he looks at me and he goes, nah. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, I know your dad listens to Rush Limbaugh all day long. <laughs> you know, your dad is a, a staunch conservative from Texas, but this is the President of the United States. Come on, go on in and play catch. Nah. So I'm thinking, okay, this isn't working. And the president's sitting there playing catch by himself in the, inside the batting cage. So I turned to the next guy who's most important to me is obviously the right-hand man of the manager. And at that time it was Ryan, or uh, Jeff Newman, our third base coach. His son, Ryan, was standing next to Andy. And I sort of pushed him in and made him play catch. And when I told Sharon this story, as you can imagine, the incredible Sharon Hargrove, she's never let me forget it, that her son, did not play catch with the President of the United States. So now we're playing catch, everything's fine. So I turned to him and I said, sir, everything all right? You look like you're doing well, big tall left-hander, big tall left-hander. You, can you pitch anymore, Rob? We did not do well today. I know. Can you throw it anymore? Yeah. I bet, I bet you could, I bet you could. And Raymond, you like Scarlet and Gray, right here, baby, good. good. Yeah, I wish I could say it was planned, but. So I asked the president, everything okay? You're doing well? He goes, I don't want to bounce the ball in the home plate. So as we all are sports people in this room, the one adage, you practice like you play. So I turned to the president and I said, sir, didn't we get you a nice dugout jacket, a baseball jacket to wear when you walk onto the mound? He goes, yes. And I said, well, put it on. Well, he leans down and put it on. And I'm sitting there going, I just ordered the President of the United States around. So he puts this jacket on, he starts playing catch. Everything's fine. I said, are you okay? He goes, I don't want to bounce the ball into home plate. We're now out standing on the top step of the dugout. Jacobs Field, inaugural day, unbelievable excitement. And I'm standing next to the President of the United States. National anthem is being played. And he turns to me and he goes, I'm nervous. And I said, don't worry, sir. I saw you throw. Sandy Alomar is six foot five. There's no way you could throw it over his head. And he goes, okay, good. I'll just let it fly. I said, yep, you let it fly. Anthem's done. We, he and I start walking out to pitcher's mound. Now, for those of you who are true sports fans know that when the Indians are opening, 
a lot of times the NC2A Final Four is being played that night on a Monday. And that year it happened to be his home state of Arkansas playing in Philadelphia for the national title. And he was going to take Air Force One immediately after the game to Philadelphia to catch the ball game. So as we're walking and as we have talked for the last 45 minutes, I think he and I are bonding, you know, that we're becoming best friends. I walk with him out to pitcher's mound and I turn to him and I said, sir, this has to be an incredible sports day for you. You know, throwing out the first pitch here at Jacobs Field and then going to Philadelphia to see your Razorbacks play for the national title. I said, you know, I'm a huge basketball fan. I said, do you have any room on Air Force One for a little Italian PR guy that loves basketball? And he looks down at me, he goes, not a chance. <laughs> and I said, well, hell, there's pitcher's mound. Don't bounce the ball in your home play. <laughs> no, I didn't, no, I didn't. That's on tape, I don't want to have that. I did not say that to the President of the United States. I was thinking it, but I did not say it. Uh, he did not. Bounce the ball in the home plate. He did it well. Um, in 11 days, we're going to be celebrating the 25th anniversary of Lenny Barker pitching a perfect game. Hank, if you can imagine, it's 25 years since that day. And there's a couple things I'd love to share with you uh, about that evening uh, that you may find interesting. First and foremost, I had a brief run a brief broadcasting career. Don Drysdale, those of you who know who Don Drysdale is, was covering the California Angels on radio at that time. They were in Detroit in a rain delay. Obviously the night Lenny pitched his perfect game, it was a rainy, drizzly night. And Don Drysdale calls me in the top of the ninth inning in the press box and said, Bobby, are you kidding me? Lenny Barker's got a perfect game going? And I said, absolutely. Well, I ended up doing the top three, you know, the top of the ninth, the, the three hitters that Lenny faced, play by play with Don Drysdale back to uh, LA on KTLA. So my brief broadcasting career lasted three outs. Um, there was a historic moment for the ladies in the crowd who are sports fans, and those of you who might be getting honored today and uh, getting a scholarship and may think about uh, the world of sports journalism. Uh, 25 years ago uh, was at the time when women were not allowed in the locker room. Obviously we have uh, grown to uh, uh, not have that rule in place, but Cleveland at that time still had the rule. We were one of the last baseball teams. Gabe Paul just found it very inappropriate and I kept fighting him that we needed to do this. And the Toronto Globe and Mail, Hank, I don't remember, Allison Gordon of the Toronto Globe and Mail is covering this game. The Blue Jays are getting, you know, a perfect game thrown at them. And as soon as I hung up a phone with Don Drysdale, sitting next to uh, Rush Snyder, who was doing the official scoring, Allison's standing right next to me. And she looks at me and she goes, you cannot keep me out of the clubhouse tonight. And I said, nope, tonight's a perfect way that we can go into the clubhouse and I will hold your hand and walk you in there myself. Well, the next day I had to go tell Gabe Paul that we allowed a female in the clubhouse and that the, uh, we have changed our policies. And he said, Bobby, you're right. Every time we pitch a perfect game, we allow a female in the locker room. So it didn't quite work. But the best part of it was one of the reporters tracked down Lenny Barker's grandmother and Lenny Barker's grandmother, 90 years old, sitting in the rural Pennsylvania where Lenny grew up, they asked her the question, did you hear what your son did this evening? And her reply was, how nice, I hope he does better next time. <laughs> and with that, these guys and ladies cannot do anything any better. I congratulate you on being Hall of Fame members and go try. Thank you, Bob. Time now for the J. Ed Ulan Awards and with the honor of uh, giving you all that information, again, WEOL's Tim Alcorn.
Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Each and every year, the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame annually honors the memory of J. Ed Uland, one of the founding members of the Hall of Fame, by presenting scholarship awards to the outstanding senior male and female student athletes nominated by their participating schools. Criteria for judging includes class rank and GPA, athletic achievements and community service, or extracurricular activities, all of which have equal value. Secret ballot voting by the committee determines the two winners of the $1,000 scholarship awards, with the runner-up nominees each receiving a $250 grant to the college of their choice. The Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame gratefully acknowledge the financial grant received from the Lakeland Healthcare Corporation Board of Directors to assist in funding these scholarship awards. If our three female nominees could please make their way to the front. The complete biography of accomplishments for these outstanding female nominees are listed for your reference on pages 46 and 47 in the program book. My introduction tonight will only include selective accomplishments for brevity's sake. Ladies and gentlemen, our first nominee is Aaron Craig from Southview High School. Erin is ranked fifth in her class out of 216 students with a terrific 3.872 grade point average. In athletics, Erin is a four-year letter winner in golf, and she was second team Northeast Ohio District in golf. Her extracurricular activities include being a member of the National Honor Society and also academic all Ohio. Ladies and gentlemen, Erin Craig of Southview High School. Our next nominee from Lorraine Admiral King High School is Sarah Pankratz. Sarah's class rank is number one out of 259 with a 4.0 GPA. <laughs> Athletically, Sarah is a letter winner in softball, basketball, and volleyball, and she was all Lake Erie League in volleyball. Extracurricular activities for Sarah include being a member of the National Honor Society, as well as her class valedictorian and a member of Student Council. Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Pankratz from Lorraine Admiral King High School. And our third nominee tonight from Clearview High School, ladies and gentlemen, Lori Weber. Lori's class rank at Clearview is number five out of 131 students with a grade point average of 4.181. Athletically, Lori is a letter winner in softball, basketball, and volleyball. Lori is a three-time first-team All-Lorraine County selection in volleyball, and her extracurricular activities include being a member of the National Honor Society, and she was also a nominee for the Wendy's High School Heisman Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Lori Weber of Clearview High School. And as they say in Lorraine, the envelope, please. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, if you could, a big round of applause for the female winner of the 2006 J. Ed Uland Award, Sarah Pankratz of Lorraine Admiral King High School. Wow. Um, I just want to say Thank you to Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame. This is a great honor, and I'm very proud to represent Lorraine Animal King as the Uland Award winner. Thank you.
If we could now have the three male nominees for the J. Ed Uland Award, please make their way forward. Introducing our first nominee from Clearview High School, Brian Sisurchi. <laughs> Brian's class rank at Clearview is number 44 out of 131 with a 3.143 grade point average. Brian is a letter winner in baseball, track and field, cross country, and he was also the cross country team captain and MVP. Brian's extracurricular activities at Clearview include being a member of the National Honor Society and a winner of the Academic Achievement Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian Sisurchi of Clearview High School. Our next nominee from Southview High School, ladies and gentlemen, Tyler Johnston. Tyler's class rank at Southview is number 10 out of 216 with a 3.913 grade point average. Tyler is a four-year letter winner in soccer and Tyler three times has been first team all Lake Erie League in soccer. He also at Southview High School is a member of the National Honor Society and Tyler is a Presidential Scholar Award nominee. Ladies and gentlemen, Tyler Johnston from Southview High School. And our third nominee, ladies and gentlemen, from Lorraine Admiral King High School, Gabriel Allen Washington. <laughs> Gabriel's class rank at Lorraine Admiral King High School is number two out of 259 with a 3.958 GPA. <laughs> Gabriel, athletically, is a letter winner in baseball and football. He was two-time captain of the football team. And Gabriel's extracurricular activities include being a member of the National Honor Society, and he is also the senior class president at Lorraine Admiral King. Ladies and gentlemen, Gabriel Allen Washington of Lorraine Admiral King. And it gives me great pleasure to announce the 2006 J. Ed Uland Award winner for the men, Gabriel Allen Washington of Lorraine Admiral King High School. What an honor um, just to win this award. Um, it was so many great people, uh, Tyler and Brian, everybody was qualified. Uh, thank you to the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame for giving me this opportunity, uh, and I won't let you down. Congratulations to both of our J. Ed Uland Award winners tonight, and again to all of the nominees. Ron, I get intimidated standing next to all that intelligence when they come up here on the dice. You can understand that. <laughs> and then there's you. <laughs> I'm not done yet, Ron. You can stay seated. Each and every year, the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame Committee annually recognizes those athletes who have achieved all Ohio honors in the past year. Tonight, we have two baseball players who received all Ohio recognition for the 2005 season. They are Anthony Ramos of Lorraine Admiral King and Tony Gonzalez of Southview High School. <laughs> Anthony and Tony's complete biography and their achievements are listed on page 48 in your program book. We congratulate them for this honor and present this plaque with our wish for continuing success in their athletic career. 
Tony Gonzalez is currently playing with the University of Tampa baseball team, and his plaque is being accepted by his father, Harold. Ladies and gentlemen, again, congratulations, Anthony Ramos of Lorraine Admiral King, Tony Gonzalez of Southview, all Ohio selections in baseball in 2005. Ron, you can get up now. Ladies and gentlemen, back to Ron Bacalar. I don't know, I kind of feel exceptionally proud tonight that uh, I spent my entire teaching career at Admiral King High School, now known as Lorraine Admiral King. Congratulations to one and all. And Sarah's a neighbor to boot. I've got the former mayor on one side and now a J. Ed Ulan Award winner on the other side. Can't get much better than that. There is no intermission, ladies and gentlemen, but we're going to give you an opportunity to stand and stretch, and I think you're going to hear Take Me Out to the Ball Game, and if you feel like singing, please be my guest. And then after about... There it is! <laughs> Once again, ladies and gentlemen, it's that time in the program when the Hall of Fame Committee proudly inducts the class of 2006 into the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame. Tonight, we will induct six individuals whose athletic achievements have earned them special recognition. Two individuals who will receive the recognition for their outstanding contributions to the sporting community and a team whose excellence brought fame to their school. I might add that these inductees were nominated by the general public, and with that said, if any of you believe that there are individuals or teams who deserve consideration for future induction into the Hall of Fame, it is up to you to obtain and submit a nominating application to the committee. Application forms are available from any committee member or at the museum and also from the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame website. Allow me now to present our first inductee and please read the complete achievements of these outstanding people in your program book because my introduction remarks are condensed and relatively brief. Inductee number one, leading off tonight's outstanding group of inductees from the regular category is Louis Lou Fasco, who enjoyed a long and honor-laden bowling career that started in 1945 and unfortunately was ended in 1968 when elbow bursitis forced his retirement from competition. Fasco was a longtime member of the Lorraine Bowling Association and bowled in multiple leagues carrying a high average. The ultimate claim to fame in the world of bowling is to roll a 300 game. Lou achieved this rarity two times, with the second perfect game being bowled in 1960 at the American Bowling Congress Tournament in Toledo and made headlines around the country. Fasco passed away in 2001 at the age of 87. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome the memory of Lou Fasco into the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame and accepting the award in behalf of her father is Patricia Flowers. Good evening, everybody. This is a bittersweet night for me. Bitter because my dad's not here to receive his award, and sweet because he's finally being recognized. Um, okay, Corky. <laughs> this one? Okay. Is this better? Yeah. Okay, I'll start over. It's a bittersweet night for me. Um, bitter because my dad's not here to receive this award. Sweet because he's finally being elected into this great club of athletes for Lorraine. Um, just a brief history of my dad. His greatest accomplishment was probably marrying my mother, Ann Ducar. My mom became his greatest fan. Um, 
and then from there on he started his bowling career. He started it in the early 40s, shortly after coming home from Iwo Jima. Um, he bowled three, four, five times a week. The old Antwerp Lanes on Vine Street, the old Redmond's that was upstairs on Broadway, and then the old Croatian Club. Um, when I was old enough to accompany him, he would let me be lucky. He would let me carry his bowling ball. Um, back then it was only one bowling ball and one pair of shoes, so I was able to handle it. Um, he enjoyed bowling tremendously, and like was said previously, probably his greatest achievement on the lanes was bowling the 300, the first one in 57. I think that was the first one that was bowled in seven years here in Lorraine. Back then, 300s were few and far between. Um, then naturally, the 300 at the ABC tournament in Toledo, it was a great experience. I was there along with my mom and we watched it. Um, when that stubborn 10 pin fell, he was hoisted on his teammates' shoulders and he was carried around the bowling alley. And that's the picture that's in the program this evening. Um, in the early 60s, middle 60s, he developed bursitis and he wasn't able to maintain the average that he was used to carrying. Um, he thought he was letting his teammates down, so he retired from bowling, a sport he dearly loved. But shortly after, he discovered fishing. And he fished with the same gusto that he bowled with, four or five times a week on the charter boat, the Miss Majestic. And he would limit out. He, whether it be walleye or perch, he would have his limit. So he earned the name Lucky Louie. And he made me lucky because even though he couldn't carry, catch the, he, even though he caught those fish, he wasn't able to carry them to the car. So we would, my daughter Christy and I would go to the boat and we would be lucky and carry his catch to the car. So I guess Louie really is lucky. Again, he's being inducted tonight into this great club of athletes. And also this year, he's being inducted into Lorraine Bowling Hall of, the Lorraine Bowling Association Hall of Fame. And I thank you all. Thank you for listening. Our next inductee from the regular category is Raymond Harris a student athlete who enjoyed outstanding success from his athletic skills on the football gridiron, but was equally proud of being named to the National Honor Society at Admiral King High School. Following a stellar scholastic career for the Admirals, Raymond accepted the opportunity to continue his education via a football scholarship at The Ohio State University. After an outstanding and record-setting four-year career with the Buckeyes, Harris enjoyed a productive six-year professional career, including several outstanding seasons with the Chicago Bears. Raymond lives in the Columbus area with his wife Leslie and their two children, and is a home mortgage consultant with Chase Bank in Columbus. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Raymond Harris into the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame. I'm so excited right now. Uh, if I do a bad job, don't blame me. Blame my high school public speaking teacher, Ron Backlog. <laughs> it's all his fault. This has been a crazy, unbelievable journey and story. And as I stand here in front of you, I can't help but go all the way back to 1983. I was 13 years old and I was in the eighth grade at Hawthorne Elementary School and I was about to go out for my first year of organized football. 
and we got going. We had a few practices, a couple of scrimmages here and there. And I wasn't a starter. I was a second or third string running back on the team. But it was time to pick out the jerseys. So at that time, my favorite player and the person that I admired and looked up to was this guy named Dennis Washington. Now, if any of you have seen Dennis Washington play football before, you know that he was an unbelievable running back. He was the best running back I'd ever seen in person. He ran hard, he was really fast, spin moves, all that stuff. And he went to Hawthorne Elementary and he was a year older than me. <laughs> and he was only, yeah, right. So, I go to the coach and I say, coach, I know what number I want. It's number 20. I'm going to be just like Dennis Washington. I was excited, pumped, had my uh, chest all poked out. And the coach laughed. He chuckled. Said, <laughs> I said, coach, what's, what's so funny? He, said, he looked at me, shook his head and said, son, I've seen you play. You'll never be as good as Dennis Washington. <laughs> and when he said that, I was so upset. As you can imagine, 13 years old, my dream, and this guy just crushes it, just like that. So when he said that, I ran home, I mean, I didn't run home, but I went home <laughs> after practice, and I remember sitting down, and I wrote a very, very long list, very long letter, and I titled it, Lorraine's Greatest Athlete. And I started to think about all the great athletes that I know from my hometown, that I've either seen, played with, watched, heard of, everybody from Gary Patton to Jerry Dunlap, Ed Wright, Paul Wilson, Frank Owens, Nandi Cruz, Dennis Washington, of course. Uh, I thought about a couple of my cousins, Tommy Harris, uh, Bubbles Harris. I thought about my brother. I thought about my father was an incredible baseball player and softball player. And I wrote all, listed all these names. And at the bottom, I wrote, one day, I will be Lorraine's greatest athlete. I was 13 years old. <laughs> now, needless to say, that's a very ambitious goal. And, 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 and I'm not standing here by no means saying that I'm Lorraine's greatest athlete. <laughs> but it was my new goal. It was my new dream. And, it, and that is exactly what I was shooting for. And standing here today in front of you, I can only say thank you so much for validating me and vindicating really the hard work and the dream that I had to be just among and with and mentioned with guys that I truly respected and honored and looked up to. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Now, I, I, played, I played football, which is arguably the greatest team sport. So I'm standing here in front of you knowing that I mean, there's no possible way I could be here without the help of so many people. So when I think back throughout my life, I think about all the great teammates and coaches that helped me. Everyone from my burger chef, minor league baseball coach, uh, Ken Shaver, all the way up to my American Legion baseball coach, Bill Tippy. I think about Coach Hayden, who embraced me, welcomed me into his family and treated me like one of his own. From my wrestling coach, Mike Gillum, to my basketball coach, Larry Jackson, my track coach, Gary Byram. I think about all these different guys and all the wonderful coaches that I had a chance to deal with throughout uh, football. Everyone from Larry Barnes to my wrestling coach, uh, John Nesbitt, and of course, Tom El Cisco. All these guys in this sport helped me nurture, learn, and understand what it took to be competitive, reach beyond where you think your maximum is, taught me that it's okay to lose. And just because you lose, you're not a loser. You get back and you come back, that means you're a winner. It's okay to cry. You're only as good as your strongest player. These are life lessons that I was taught in sports and I carry to this day. So as I work with my kids and I mentor other young impressionable minds, I'm able to pass that on. So I truly appreciate that. I really want to take this moment to thank somebody that's extremely important to me. His name is Harvey Herman. He is the guy that taught me and showed me that it's more than just being able to run really fast and, and catch a ball, but you have to be well-rounded. You have to concentrate on your academics, and being smart is an asset. 
because being smart will allow me to realize a dream that will take me beyond just my hometown of Lorraine. So Mr. Herman, I truly appreciate that, that knowledge. I'd like to thank my, thank you, please, please acknowledge me. I'd like to thank my, my father and my sister who raised me and didn't give up on me, even though my mother passed away when I was a little baby. I'd like to thank my family that supported me, especially my cousin Stan, who was my number one, my number one supporter and number one fan. I'd like to thank my friends who inspired me, my teammates that did all the dirty work that allowed me to get all the glamour and score all the touchdowns. I know that without all of these people, I would not be here right now. So I truly, truly appreciate all of that. And as I go on in life and I, I make my way in this world and the new people that I meet and I raise my kids and I mentor and coach other young minds, anybody that asks me and that wanna know where I'm from, I am so truly honored and privileged to let them know that I'm from Lorraine, Ohio. Thanks a lot. Excuse me, I'm sorry. One, one other thing, I'm sorry. In 1994, I went back, came back to uh, Lorraine, went to Hawthorne Elementary, and the number 20 jersey was retired. I'm happy to say that it's no longer Dennis Washington's number, it's now mine. <laughs> Super job, Raymond. Super. You retained everything I taught you. Good eye contact, great gestures, unbelievable vocal expression, super posture, A+. Plus. Our third inductee from the regular category is Robert Rob Lifjack who was a multi-talented athlete at Lorraine High School where he earned seven varsity letters in baseball, football, and basketball. He was an outstanding football player gaining local and state recognition for his football abilities. In baseball, as a dominant power hitter and left-handed pitcher, he was accorded many awards including being named a high school All-American. He was considered by his coach to be the best hitter he has ever seen at Lorraine High. After considering scholarship offers in both baseball and football, Rob chose to play baseball at Ohio University, where he continued to excel. As a southpaw pitcher and power hitting position player, he contributed to the Bobcats' success in winning the MAC League Championship in 1982 and again in 1983. He subsequently pursued a professional baseball career and spent four years with the St. Louis Cardinals minor league system before requesting his release. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Robert Rob Lifchak into the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame. My name's Rob, and I'm a sports addict. <laughs> it all started when I was five. I think about sports every day. And I go to sleep, and uh, I just, I just uh, wow, this is great. My family's here. Uh, I'm around a bunch of people that I know their faces, and we've all 20 years older, aren't we? <laughs> But uh, a lot of times you, you, you go ahead and you try to figure out what you want to say. You give me four minutes to do it. I look around and uh, see some guys I played with, uh, played against. I'm doing it wrong, aren't I? Okay. <laughs> um, but what I do remember is a lot of people that touched my life. I wouldn't be standing here. Uh, I got Mr. Schulich. Uh, he was my minor league coach when I was seven, eight, nine, 
and then uh, picked us up when we were 13. Uh, Ragtag bunch of guys. Uh, we were 125 to 15. And uh, I don't know how you did it, but uh, I, I told them earlier, and I will tell everybody that I'm always, and I was always proud to be Al Schulich's boy. I was one of his boys, and that's special. You know, uh, my first hero, everybody says they got first heroes. My first hero is my older brother, Scott. Uh, I wanted to do everything with him. Uh, I was I an was opportunity. Uh, I do everything right-handed other than hit and throw, and that's because of him. Either that or I had to borrow his glove all the time. But, you know, it was just amazing. Grew up across the street from Lorraine High School. Uh, spent all my time in that gym. Uh, I, I just dreamed of being a Lorraine High Steel. Uh, you know, playing back football for Lorraine High, wow, you know, uh, what tradition we had at that time. Uh, you know, what those coaches did for us. You know, back in those days, we're going to take you back to 1979, the fall of 1979. And uh, there was a thing going on that I didn't understand at the time, but it was a teacher strike. All I wanted to do was play football. And these gentlemen uh, walked across the line, we had makeshift, <laughs> makeshift school, we had math, and we had this and that, and then in the afternoons we watched Bridge Over River Kwai <laughs> in, the, in the choir. But these guys kept us together. We missed those two games. And it's, you know, you go back and you know, I always say, oh, what if? Well, the only what if I have in my life is what if we would have had those two games? And how special that team was. You guys did a great job with us. You know, I remember, what I remember is, you know, we're all get. I remember my wife tells me, Amy tells me, I get foggy sometimes about some of the things. And I, you know, that I, my fish is a little bit bigger. Um, but what I do remember, what I do remember is, is that I remember what those guys did. And, and the best thing about it, it showed us that, you know, we can overcome something, anything, just as long as we put mind to it. What I remember is being on that football field. Um, I don't, I don't remember ever coming off other than on kickoff and kick returns um, or uh, leg cramps or uh, when Mr. Provident had to discuss my defensive prowess. You know, he'd tell me, oh, you're doing this wrong or something. But when Mr. Provident lets you know, he gets you and sends you back out. But we had a great time and I still hear 618 on the color in my dreams because we run in a sweep, run in a sweep. But the most special thing about that football time was uh, on a Tuesday, we were playing Sandusky, and they came out with an offensive play. And then Tuesday was practice day for offense, I believe. And they come out and they said, we're going to do this new play. And this new play is going to be a tight end reverse pass. And they're going to call it lift check special. And I, wow. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're practicing it all week, and I'm throwing it 50 yards, throwing ducks downfield. And all of a sudden, uh, it's right before halftime, and come back after throwing, you know, after we threw a couple times in a row, right? Wow, that didn't happen to um, the Steelman, right? But we threw a couple times in a row and all of a sudden they said, lift check special. Went around through that and lofted it up 20, 29 yards to Gary Risden for a touchdown. And I know those gentlemen that coached a lot of ball players for all those years, for many years. And I know for a fact, I feel very, very honored because there's only probably a handful that ever had a name play, uh, named after, a play named after. Yeah. And you know, that, that was something, and it's something that, that really stuck with me. Uh, playing on a basketball team with uh, Coach Riker and Mr. Harpin, uh, wow, um, I never thought I was a basketball player. I would have never played basketball if it wasn't for Mr. Mr. Yunker. Uh, I was gonna not gonna play my JV year after my JV football, and he decided that, uh, well, if you're not going to do that, you got to stay in shape for baseball, so you're going to run with me. Well, we ran at 3 o'clock in the afternoon during basketball practice, and I said, this is a lot harder than what those guys are doing. I'm going to go ahead and start playing basketball. So we ended up starting playing basketball, and uh, you know, my basketball career, I could say, uh, I believe I averaged more fouls and points in my junior year. And, uh, um, you know, they taught me, and Mr. Riker taught me, uh, Mr. Hartman, that uh, we all need role players. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I was like, well, I was Kurt Rambis and 
and Bill Lambeer without a jump shot. So if that tells you anything. Um, but one of the things is that they did, they did this, for some reason, junior year, they decided, okay, we're going to change up our line drills. Instead of running and touch the line and, and then going back with your hand, oh, somebody decided it was a good idea to dive and touch it with your chest and then backpedal. And for many years, I was like, well, I got to ask those guys, who thought that was a great idea? <laughs> And how many years did you get away with it? I, you know, for many years. But then all of a sudden, I'm reflecting back and I'm looking through some old articles. My mom collect, collected them all. And this is a quote after the Medina game my junior year. This team didn't have, have exceptional talent, but they got a lot of guts. And sometimes I think guts are better than talent. A lot of people saw, uh, predicted we only went four or five games, but we fooled them. We, we ended up 13 and 8 that year. And wow, what a great job. That was probably their best coaching job ever because we didn't have anybody but one guy over six foot that I was on the court and then I come in off the bench and play for a quarter and a half and foul out. So <laughs> that was my job. <laughs> but um, I look at it uh, baseball, baseball. I got the opportunity to play for the same coach my older brother played for. I remember when they congregate across when I, from the high school and go down to George Daniel Field, and I'd be the bat boy. And I always wanted to play, be a Lorraine Hines Steelman baseball player. And I always wanted to play baseball. That was my love. So what was so neat is that when I was a JV player my freshman year, I got to wear my older brother's uniform. And so I passed down from the varsity, and he's seven years older, so, so how old were those uniforms, huh? They had no knees in them or nothing. <laughs> Zippers were broken. Oh, wow. You know, well, here's your issue. All right. So, uh, but, you know, playing for Coach Fariga, Vic Fariga, what a great man. He was not only my baseball coach, but he was, uh, he was, he was also my football coach and the tight end. And, you know, um, he taught me how to, I don't care, he was just so even keeled. Um, and I can still hear him uh, out there yelling, hey, liver, quit getting cute, let's go right at him. And, uh, you know, to go on from that. But I just wanted to point all these, you know, a few things I'll remember about, you know, there were so many with uh, Coach Fariga and so many things that it's hard to go ahead and encapsulate it in, uh, in four or five minutes. So uh, if you guys need uh, any stories about ex-coaches, we can meet over here because I got some dandy ones. I, can re I don't remember names, but I know stories. So, um, but I have to say a couple more things. One is 18-year-old um, boy all of a sudden being pushed out of uh, Lorraine and get an opportunity to go to OU. Um, I couldn't have gone to a better man uh, for a boy at 18 than Coach Jerry France at OU. What a great person. Um, and, you know, if it wasn't for him, I, I know I, if it wasn't for baseball or sports, I, I wouldn't have an education. And then if it wasn't for my wife, Amy, uh, I wouldn't have finished my education. <laughs> so I surrounded myself with pretty doggone good people. Um, but, you know, um, I just want to thank my family, you know, my sister, uh, Karen and Connie and uh, uh, my younger brother, Wes, and uh, my brother, Scott, and... Um, I gotta say something about the wisest man in my life. Uh, it was my dad, dad Dave Livchek. And if, uh, you know, I'm about like him. Um, but, uh, you know, he had two things. He, he was so wise, and, he, and one of the, the smartest things he ever said to me, and if you knew Dave, he said, do as I say, don't do as I do. If you know what Dave was, and he sure did pick me up at the right time. So. What I'd like to do is say thank you to everyone. If I haven't, everyone here or everybody that's been touched my life has made it so important. And my wife has been great for the last 19 years. We've known each other for 23. And there was a period of time when I was trying to make it to the big leagues that I was a fictitious boyfriend. <laughs> so we all know how many sacrifices. That whole table over there sacrificed a lot for me. And I want to thank you. And it's a great honor and a great privilege to be included in your guys' club, now my club also. Thank you very much.
Our fourth inductee from the regular category is Larry Olowinski. Larry developed a reputation at Lorraine Catholic as a gifted, sure-handed wide receiver and an elusive kick returner. He was selected first team All-North Central Conference in both his junior and senior years. He then took these skills to St. Joseph College in Indiana where he produced team and league leading offensive numbers. During his sophomore season, he led the team and the Great Lakes Valley Conference in all receiving categories, which earned him a spot on the little All-American team. He continued to garner honors during his last two years and still holds the school record for most career receiving yards. In 1998, Larry was inducted into the St. Joseph College Sports Hall of Fame. Larry resides in the Chicago area with his wife, Dee, and their three daughters. He is the sales director for New York Life Benefit Services in the Windy City. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Larry Olowinski into the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame. everybody. Raymond, I had Jim Lawhead as a teacher and Jim told me to have good notes all the time so I'm going to use mine tonight. So let me get my glasses out here. Well, thank you everybody. This is a tremendous, tremendous honor. In preparing for this evening, I was trying to reflect on games and particular plays that I was involved with over 30 years ago. I came to the realization that reliving a game or an individual play with any accuracy is next to impossible. For example, if you asked me to describe a big play during a game in 1975, I'd probably give you one version. Waldecki would give you another version. Bobby Flores would give you another version. You know, the me your memories are going to fade after a while. So rather than reminisce on individual accomplishments, I'd like to reflect on the city of Lorraine in the era that I grew up in and how that experience contributed to making my football experience so successful and so much fun. I'm bored. There's nothing to do. It's a common lament of every little kid out there. Go out and play it was a mother's comeback, and my mom was no different. Except in Lorraine, you went out and you played football. And in my opinion, most other sports were the offseason, and I really loved the sport of football. Growing up, my closest childhood friend was a kid by the name of Tim Bonko. Tim played his high school football at Admiral King and was a very, very effective fullback for Admiral King. He was also the starting catcher on the baseball team. Uh, Tim was also the little brother of Don Bonko, uh, who was inducted in the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame in 1975, and as many of you remember, was a very big, very good running back. I give you all this as a backdrop to let you know that Tim, Tim Bonko was a big kid even when he was a little kid. And I was a very little kid, as a little kid. Around 1961 or 1962, our parents got Tim and I football uniforms from a local department store. That would have made us about seven years old. Uh, somebody in the crowd correct me, but I don't think there were very good safety standards on toy football equipment back in 1962. But nonetheless, Tim and I would play our version of football. Uh, Tim would suggest that we line up at opposite ends of the, opposite ends of the backyard. One of us would have the ball and the other would have to tackle the other. We would set off at a distance of about 20 or 30 yards from one another and run full speed into each other. Not too bright. Uh, in 1962, I did not know where my football career was taking me, but I think that Tim Bonko subtly convinced me that running back and linebacker were not going to be positions that I was going to pursue. F fast forward to the era covering 1969 to 1976. Lorraine High School sports programs were dominating all over the state. The athletes from Lorraine that were playing football at the college level probably numbered in the dozens. Yet during this period of high, football pro high profile football programs, 
I can honestly say that some of the most intense and fun football games that I ever played was not at George Daniels Stadium. It was not at Lorraine Catholic Stadium. Uh, it was not even at the Puma Den in Rensselaer, Indiana. Some of the best football I ever played was at Lakeview Park. You see, if you wanted to test yourself at a very young age in those days, you just showed up at 6 o'clock in the evening on a, sun, uh, on a Sunday evening during the summer months. These games were not organized. Nobody gave you a call. You just knew that there was going to be a game on a Sunday night. Young men from the ages of 14 to 22 would be playing these games, high school freshmen to college seniors. What used to throw me was being a high school wide receiver, having the opportunity to play against a college defensive back. This was just an absolute thrill for me. Uh, these games were, were a gas, and you grew up very quick in the sport of football just by playing the game. In closing, I'd like to thank the tremendous teammates that I've had the opportunity to play with. Many of them are in the back. Uh, many of my idols when I was a grade schooler sitting at the table over here. Sick told Reese, I can remember him walking into my house when I was a little kid and just being in awe at these guys. Um, I'd also like to thank Dan Petticord and Dave Thomas, who are my coaches at the CYO level. Volunteer coaches at the youth level are the foundation of any sport, and I had two of the absolute best in those guys. Tim Rose, argu arguably one of the best coaches this state has ever seen for teaching me that discipline and preparation does pay off. And to my high school buddies who also, who always found humor in some of the most disciplined moments that Tim Rose tried, tried to give us. And Bill Jennings, my college coach, who let you know that the game was there to win, but it was okay to have fun in the process. At one point during my St. Joe career, there were seven players from Lorraine Catholic that were in the starting lineup at St. Joe's, so that also made it a very, very special four-year period for me. Finally, I'd like to thank my mother and father, Stan, for making me go out and play, your, and for supporting me every, in every step of the way. In case you're wondering, my mother is the president of, is the international president of the Larry Olowinski Fan Club. <laughs> there, there are two members, her and me, but that's absolutely okay, so, and that's good enough. Thank you very much for this very, very special honor, everybody. Long before he became Colonel Virgil Williams, a distinguished 25-year Army veteran, he was simply Virgil Williams, football extraordinaire at Lorraine High School. While he played baseball and basketball, it was on the football field that he was especially talented. He set conference rushing records in his junior year and was named to the second team All-Ohio. In his senior year, while leading the Buckeye Conference in rushing yards, he was named All-County, All-District, and First Team All-Ohio. Virgil continued his football career at the University of Michigan under coach Bo Schembechler before sustaining a knee injury. After recovering, he transferred to the University of Toledo and played two seasons as a defensive free safety, leading the team in interceptions as a junior and earned a spot on the all Mid-American Conference first team defense. Colonel Williams and his wife Mary and their two children currently reside in Italy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Virgil Williams into the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame. glasses on. I've been walking around talking to folks and haven't been able to see that well, so I'll put these on now. <laughs> oh, wait, you, you are gray. I didn't recognize that. 
Oh, Mr. Provident, I told you you looked the same as you did 20 years ago. I lied. I can tell now. And Raymond, I'm disappointed you didn't mention me in your speech. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the military, they teach you to stay on time. I'm supposed to get four minutes, so I'm going to stick to that. Um, I, I plan to stick to that, uh, but since all my fellow inductees have kind of went over, I feel like I could go over a little bit. <laughs> and before I get into, into to, to my written comments, uh, you know, I felt tonight uh, it's been such a wonderful night that uh, it's time to forgive. Um, and I've been carrying, uh, just share a story, I've been carrying a couple of grudges on a couple of folks, and I, by chance, ran into them this evening. Uh, Mr. Yunker, my fifth grade teacher. <laughs> Can you believe he paddled me? <laughs> and I've been carrying that around for so many years. I forgive you, Mr. Yunker. <laughs> And my freshman coach in high school, um, Coach Solomon. That was a surprise, I'm glad you're here. Uh, but I have never forgiven you for moving me from tailback to fullback. Uh, I've never forgiven you for uh, causing us to do so many up and downs, up and downs. And I've never forgiven you for not ever taking me out of the game when I was a freshman. I played every single play, every single play. That aside, uh, let, me, uh, let me begin by saying what an honor, and uh, thank you, Ron Balagar, uh, for that generous and kind introduction. I would also like to thank the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame Committee uh, for hosting this event and taking time to recognize the contributions of the newly elected inductees. To my good friend, uh, Wade, who nominated me for this honor, I proudly and respectfully say thank you. Uh, you're a true friend, and I love you dearly. I freely admit that I'm very excited, very excited, and I hope you admit that uh, I have cause to be excited. I admit, too, that I feel very proud today. I have only to look at the other inductees, though, and immediately I am humbled. When I see their names and their achievements, I know that I'm simply a dwarf amongst giants. Nonetheless, I accept with deep gratitude and humility this award. Football, and pretty much for that matter, all sports have been a part of my life for as long as I can remember. I've had my disappointments, of course, uh, but that's part of life. Football is a game that teaches kids and adults powerful lessons, lessons that contribute to making us successful human beings. Teamwork, dedication, trust, faith, and a never give up attitude are lessons that I've learned and that I've been able to apply successfully throughout my life. To have been chosen for this wonderful privilege, uh, I think it's uh, right to share this with others uh, because they helped me achieve to what I've achieved today. I thank all, first of all, I thank all my family members and friends that are here this evening and those that were unable to attend. There is no way to give each proper credit, but the impact you have had on my life, suffice to say, without your love and steadfast support, I would not have made it very far. I want to share this honor equally with my wife, Mary. Words can never express or time allow me um, to say thank you and that I love you dearly. You really made every good thing possible in my life. I want to also thank my children that are here this evening, Christine and Burge, uh, and my granddaughter, Michaela. Uh, you guys are the most treasured possessions, most valuable trophies in my life, and I want to thank each of you. A special thank you to my mother, who supported me throughout my entire life. Raising seven boys and one girl is not an easy task. And although some of us may have temporarily ventured down the wrong path, it surely wasn't because of how you raised us. You always taught us to trust in God, do what's right, do your best, and treat people the way that you would want them to treat you, with dignity and respect. The coaches who inspired me and my teammates were, of course, the ones who made this possible for me to be chosen. In accepting this award, I do so on behalf of those coaches 
and teammates because without them, truly without them, I would not be here this evening. You know, my nephew uh, Darius asked his mother and father upon hearing uh, uh, that I was to be inducted in the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame. He asked, uh, what did Uncle Birch do to get this level of recognition? Kind of surprised. He looks at me now and says, what could he have actually done? <laughs> well, uh, nephew, tonight I hope I gave you a couple of those answers to your question because you see, I did absolutely nothing alone. I had some help. I had my friends my family, my teammates, and my coaches. Finally, I, I'd like to want to say that uh, whatever favor I have gained is ultimately due to the blessings that I've received from God. God's grace is particularly clear in life's great challenges and life's great moments. This is one of those moments for me, and I owe a debt of gratitude that is hopeless to repay. This is a very special moment, and it's made even more special by each of you attending this wonderful event. This evening, I am grateful and touched because I am accepting an award that means more than words can ever say. And before I sit down, I have one, one request. I ask that each of you say a prayer when you get home this evening for our brave men and women in the armed forces currently in harm's way. They too are Hall of Famers. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much and may God bless you. The final inductee from the regular category is Paul Wilson. Paul Wilson, an outstanding prep and collegiate player whose strengths were scoring and rebounding. Wilson was a three-year starter at Lorraine Catholic and set school career records by scoring 1,624 points for an average of just over 19 points per game and grabbing 833 rebounds for an average of 10 per game. Paul was first team all Erie Coast Conference three times, conference most valuable player as a junior and senior, and Associated Press number one team all Ohio in his senior year. Wilson went to Bradley University on a full scholarship and immediately contributed to the Braves' success as they won the Missouri Valley Conference Championship and Paul was voted to the all-tournament team for the MVC tournament. He was a co-captain during his senior year, and Bradley again won the Missouri Valley Conference Championship with a 26 and five record. Paul, with his wife, Delora, and son reside in the Columbus area. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Paul Wilson into the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame. say thanks to a lot of people. Um, I've seen a lot of familiar faces. Haven't seen in quite some time. Um, first, Coach Herman, uh, my seventh and eighth grade coach. Um, coach Tippy, my American Legion baseball coach. I want to say thank you. Um, also, I would like to say thank you to all of the other inductees. You guys have all had great careers. All been pretty predominant in the uh, Lorraine area. Congratulations. Uh, first, I would like to say thank you to the Lawheads. Uh, Mr. Lawhead, your family has always been uh, more than just a coach. Uh, Ms. Lawhead, steak dinners, 14 years old. Hey, I thought how good, you know, couldn't get any better than this, 14 eating steaks before games. Um, Matt, Jimmy, Michael, Lisa, uh, Moe, Kathy, Jason, you're probably my biggest fan. <laughs> 
from day one. Um, Coach, I just want to say um, you've been everything. You, you accepted me from day one. I will always appreciate that. Um, people don't know Coach Lawhead, if you hear that whistle, you knew there was, a, there was an issue. Um, you took me in as a player and you let me become the player that I became through high school and college. Um, as I've said many of times, you get an individual six foot five, six foot six as a freshman, you put them on the block and you leave them there. And then they rot. They get to college and they don't know where to go from there. And coach, you let me be the player that I always wanted to be. You put me in a position to succeed. You've had an impact on my life as well as the whole Lawhead family, and I appreciate that very much. Um, Lorraine Catholic was great for me. Uh, we had a, a great run. I think it was something special um, the whole four years. Um, once I started to make a name for myself my sophomore year, um, people were shooting for Lorraine Catholic, and I knew I had to be on my best every game. When I played every game, I wanted people, when they left the court after playing myself, I did not want them to say he wasn't as good as they said he was. I wanted them to say he was better. And uh, I took pride every time I stepped on the floor. Um, I represented Lorraine Catholic, the city of Lorraine, and as well as my family. Um, I also want to say thank you to my mother, my brother, and my sister who couldn't be here this evening. Um, as well as the rest of my family that I have here. Um, my Uncle Craig, who's here, who started Admiral King, played football, he was probably the best athlete in the family. But after uh, being inducted to the Hall of Fame, I think I own that title now. <laughs> <laughs> my Uncle Thomas, been a great influence, always gave me encouragement, always helped me out. Uh, my Uncle Gene, who couldn't be here, uh, has always been competitive in our family. Um, no matter if you said the Wilson name, you, if you didn't know me, you knew someone in my family. Um, my aunts, not all could be here. My Aunt Debbie's who's here. My cousin Donovan, my Aunt Susie. I want to say thank you to all. I appreciate everything that they've done for me. They've always been in my corner. They've always supported me. They always looked up. They always gave, told me if I was doing right or wrong, and I appreciate that very much. To my wife, who I didn't know when I was playing, to this day, she still doesn't think I can play, so she might have to please tell her that I could play a little bit. Um, not going to um, prolong this. I just want to say it's, a, it's an encouragement. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be a member of the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame. Um, last but not least, my dad. <laughs> For you guys that don't know him, <laughs> like having two full-time coaches. <laughs> Coach Lawhead is calling one play, he's calling another. <laughs> so no matter what came out of it, I was going to be up the creek. <laughs> I think this says the best as far as my father is. I think I had the best game of my career in Toledo. I had just broken Ron Harper's record and scored 46 points. I was excited. We were on our way to the state tournament. The city of Lorraine was happy. I thought I had a great game. I did my interviews. First person I see after the game is my dad. He walks up to me and he says, you should have had 50. <laughs> and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> but like I said, there's been a lot of great athletes that have come through the Lorraine school system. Great athletes, but not all of them can say they're a member of the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame. Thank you. The first inductee from the special category is Reese Morgan, who has experienced athletic prowess as a high school and college player and coach. Morgan was a three-year letterman at St. Mary High School and was named three times to the North Central Conference All-League team for his defensive play. Reese went on to Wartburg College in Iowa, where he was a four-year starter at linebacker, and was team captain his senior year. His coaching career started at Benton, Iowa Community High School where his teams reached the state playoffs three times. 
Reese then moved on to Iowa City West High School in 1992 and took over a program that had lost 35 games in a row. When he left after the 1999 season, the record shows that West High had won three state class 4A championships. He left the program with a 26 game winning streak. It earned him Iowa High School Coaches Hall of Fame honors. Reese joined the University of Iowa coaching staff in 2000 as tight ends coach and recruiting coordinator. He was named offensive line coach in 2003 and has been an integral part of the Hawkeye program. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Reese Morgan into the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame. bunch there's uh, some old uh, former high school classmates and uh, I'll reference them just in a little bit certainly I'm very honored and humbled to be up here in this prestigious group if you're in the special category that means you weren't a good enough athlete to be a regular category. <laughs> so you have to find another way to, 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 to recognize yourself football is the ultimate team game okay it really is and certainly a lot more people had a lot more to do with myself standing up here before you today than myself you know, and certainly some of our teammates who are here today from St. Mary's, Mike and Frank Coughlin, Timmy Majeski, Dave Snell, Billy McPhee, John and Mike Burke. Uh, it, it, I take great pride, tremendous pride in saying I'm from Lorraine, Ohio. You know, when I think of Lorraine, I think of the core values of this community, okay, that are embodied in the people and in this community. When you think of Lorraine, the first thing I think of is toughness, tough community, blue collar, hard-working, factory people. You know, my dad worked in a factory, my uncles worked in a steel plant, you know, my grandfather's worked there, and you know, you, 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 you know that, that was instilled in you. A tremendous strong work ethic is an undercore value. The other thing the people from Lorraine do, they take great pride in what they do. Great, great pride in doing a job well done. Just go by Lakeview Park and take a look at that. Look at some of the lawns and the yards in this, this community. It's a diverse community. It's a melting pot. You know, the, the, the International uh, Festival references that, that strength of this community. Also, it's a very caring and giving community. I know uh, firsthand when our mother passed away, the outreach that we had from the community, which was just so, so, so special. And it's, it has a tradition of strong athletics. I have fond memories growing up, going out as a elementary school and a, a junior high kid going out to George Daniel on Friday nights and Saturday nights and, and, and seeing your heroes and watching high school football in this community and seeing so many thousands of people out there. What great memories. One of the memories that, that, that's very, very special to me was as an elementary school kid, my grandma lived on 8th Street right down the street from St. Mary's. And I could hear the clickety-clack coming down the sidewalk and here were the, the, the football players were on their way to practice. They're wearing their spikes down the, down the thing and I'd hide in the bushes and I'd see them walk by, and they're carrying these gold helmets. I thought, one day, boy, I'm gonna, I, I want to wear, wear one of those gold helmets and play for the Fighting Irish, and, and that dream came true. Uh, I have the greatest job in the world, the greatest job in the world. I have never worked a day in my life. <laughs> I, I never have. You know, for the last 33 years, I've been going and playing and having fun with young people. And what an invigorating and, 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 and special profession coaching is. There have been a lot of people that have had a tremendous impact on all of our lives and certainly want to recognize a few, starting with my dad. My dad's 82 years old. You know, he, he, he taught me what work is, what a tremendous work ethic he had. He, he taught me to do things right. I remember uh, cleaning the basement probably several times before I'd met his, his rigid expectations. And, and, and he taught me that tough times don't last, but tough people do. Okay, he, he's, he's 82 right now. He can outwork me, 
and I know he's, he's a lot tougher than I am too, I'll tell you that. Uh, my sister Sue, uh, you know, what, she kind of held our family together there, you know, after our mom passed away, you know, and our, our dad was a single parent raising four kids, and she kind of held everybody together and raised our, our, our younger siblings and, and just did a tremendous job. So Sue, thank you. And of course, Dave, Dave's the better athlete of the family. He's the one that should be up here. You know, he's here, came here with his son, uh, Davey. So thank you very much. And, you know, the, the, the great teammates, the great thing about coaching is not so much the successes and the, and the wonderful things that you're able to generate, but the thing you remember the most are the relationships. The relationships that you develop with the people that you work with, the players, the coaches, the parents. And there's one individual that's been absolutely probably my best friend uh, for many, many years, and that's John Burke. John has been a friend, a mentor. We communicate regularly. We competed against each other in junior high, went to high school together, went to the same college together, along with Dave Snell and some other guys. And, and we just have, you know, it's just one of those friendships that's gone on, and, and I, I value it greatly, John. And, and, and primarily the coaches who have impacted our lives, all of us here in this room, and, and I think of our junior high coach, Ed McGinnis, you know, Bill Philbin, our, our coach at St. Saint, Saint, uh, Mary's, and certainly uh, probably the one person that had, the reason I'm standing here today is Tim Rose. Uh, Tim Rose had that special knack of getting the most out of players, getting you to believe that you could do things you didn't think you could do. He had such passion, such enthusiasm for life, that he just transponded that into everybody. I recall the first workout we had. He said, it's gonna take a half hour. You know, we came up and we thought, hey, this is gonna be a piece of cake. Well, after about 25 minutes, we, we couldn't handle it anymore. We were not able to, to withstand what he put us through. And he really uh, got the very most out of us. But the biggest lessons that I think, and the biggest impact on, our, on my life as a coach has not been necessarily from these people, but it's been from the athletes that, I, that I've had the privilege to work with. I've learned more from them than they've ever learned from me. Had the chance to, 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 to develop my personal philosophy about life and about coaching from those young men that I've had the joy of working with. You know, to believe in yourself, to, ne to do your very best in everything you do, to never ever give up, and to know and understand the importance of teamwork. Uh, my wife Jo has accompanied uh, me tonight, and, uh, and she, you know, she's my best friend, and she said not to say anything about her, but uh, it's a long ride back to Iowa, and I want to make sure it's comfortable. <laughs> and, and, and in closing, we all have heroes in our life, and uh, uh, I've got one back in, at home that's pretty special to me. That's our daughter Jessica, and she is just... You know, the, the, the way she has handled the adversity that she's been given in her life has just been uh, such a, such a given us so much encouragement and joy. And, and uh, please, uh, you know, let me uh, just share this with you. On behalf of, uh, you know, uh, of myself, I, I feel very uh, honored to, to be recognized and certainly uh, not because of athleticism, it's just because I've been fortunate enough to be around great people. Thank you very much. Our final inductee from the special category is William Bill Tippy, who enjoyed an outstanding baseball, football, and track career at Lorraine High School, where he excelled as a pitcher and a quarterback. Bill continued his football career at Finley College and was the starting quarterback as a freshman. He ended his college career after two seasons and returned to Lorraine and embarked on an amazing service career devoted to young athletes. Tippy was an umpire for over 45 years, but that was not his only role. He also coached and managed youth teams for 25 years and led his teams to numerous championships. The Mickey Mantle class team won the state championship for 15 consecutive years and all his teams dominated play in their age divisions. Tippy Insurance provided sponsorship for many teams that provided youths the opportunity to play baseball. Bill Tippy's long time and complete commitment to baseball and the youth of Lorraine will be hard to beat. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bill Tippy into the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame.
seems to be giving everybody trouble tonight. I would like to say I'm very ha happy and very honored to be included in this group of inductees, especially with the smiling Raymond down there and Paul over here. I'd like to say thank you to at least four that I can think of, and I'm sure there are many, many more. First, I know there was a lot of hard work and a lot of badgering of the committee that went on for many years to make this happen. So I'd like to say thanks to Robin, Ron, Mark, and all the others that put in all that hard time. <coughs> Secondly, I'd like to say thanks to the committee for listening. I appreciate it very much. Most of what I was going to talk about was said. Um, I coached for 25 years, amateur baseball. It all started back when my wife insisted that I help out with a little league program. The two apples of her eye, Ron and Chris, were on a team that was a perennial doormat, and she thought I might be able to help. <laughs> I don't think either of us recognized at that time where that was going to lead, but the team I inherited, I have to say, was not terribly laden with talent. <laughs> so we decided if we couldn't out-talent them, maybe we could outwork them. And we practiced, and we practiced, and every day we practiced. And we did get a little better. Back then, the, the Lorraine Little League program was divided into two 14-game halves. And in spite of all of our efforts, in the first half of that season, we managed to win two games. We finished two wins, one tie, and 11 losses and in last place as usual. But in the second half of the season, we turned it around. And we won 11 games and lost three and finished in first place. That meant we had to have a playoff with the first half champion and we were fortunate enough to win that game. And our next obstacle was a team that was 28-0. Best out of three, we won two, and moved on to the city finals. Unfortunately, our magic ran out after that. But that team of overachievers was so proud of themselves. And my seeing the joy on their faces and the sense of accomplishment on their faces and their parents was an awesome thing and I was hooked. <laughs> From that point on I was doomed to be out there on that field with a bunch of boys. And by the way that group the next year won it all. For the next 23 years I coached traveling baseball teams. We moved up the ladder a little bit I don't think when we started out that we could figure out how we were going to measure up against the best financed and most highly recruited teams from around the state and around the country. As this gentleman pointed out, I was at it 23 years and in 18 of those years we came away the best of the best. I don't know that anyone who has not been somehow involved at that level of amateur baseball could appreciate what the boys from Lorraine did year after year. But of all the comments that have been made tonight about Lorraine and the athletes, I think that was an understatement compared to what these boys accomplished. So my third thank you has to go to the boys because I'm riding up here on their shirt tails. They did all the work, they won all the games, and I've gotten a lot of the credit. So boys, and I see a bunch of them sitting out there around the table, a couple behind me, thank you very much 
for all your dedication and hard work. I'm very proud to be up here and represent you. And my last one is a little more difficult. My fourth thank you requires me to admit that as a young man, I was just a little bit of a knucklehead. It's interesting that Hank Lazowski is sitting over there and Ed Dehanis, who was my first football coach. I'm sure that they would second the motion that I was quite a knucklehead. A talented knucklehead, but a knucklehead nonetheless. Back in the 60s, Lorraine was a different town. Uh, it was growing, bustling, rapidly approaching 100,000 in population. American shipbuilding was still here. U.S. Steel was booming. The Ford plant was booming. And there were opportunities for anyone that wanted to work. For a young man, there was also plenty of opportunity to find trouble if you so chose. And I was sometimes pretty close to getting into that kind of trouble. I never got in any serious trouble, did I, Hank? But I well could have, and may probably would have, had it not been for two items. Of, and the first was sports, and the second was a beautiful young lady who came into my life and set standards that I was afraid to break. I spent the rest of my life trying to live up to those standards and to be worthy of her love. I wish she could be here tonight. She spent all these years being mom to these boys. Unfortunately, she passed away three years ago and we all miss her very much. So my fourth thank you goes to Doreen. Thank you very much, you were my salvation and you were my life and I miss you very much. Thank you very much for welcoming me into this group. I appreciate it. Boys, thank you for coming. I appreciate that very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Clearview Clippers entered the 1959 football season riding the momentum of an eight-game winning streak. When the 59 season ended, their perfect 9-0 record extended the win streak over two seasons to 17 straight victories and established the Clippers as a special team in school history. Their potent offense dominated all games as they outscored their opponents 380 points to 56. This talent-laden team under head coach Paul Amadeo was offensively explosive, being led by twin halfback, second team All-Ohio, Dennis Provenza, and first team All-Ohio, John McCaslin. The blocking of the line, led by All-Ohio center Walt Sestelli, made the running game work. The defensive team manhandled their opponents in registering four shutouts on their way to an undefeated season. We now invite the team members to come forward to the awards area. And representing the team are Coach Paul Amadeo, and team captain, John McCaslin. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the undefeated 1959 Clearview Clippers into the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame.
Thank you very much for that. As the team makes its way to the podium here to receive this honor, I'm going to just make a few comments. I also received that letter, as everybody did. It said I had four minutes to speak, and I answer it with, it took them 45 years to bring him into the Hall of Fame. I don't think you're going to get away with four minutes with me. I thank the committee, not only for their great work in, in tracking down this vast number of players, but for having the courage to bring in teams as a group. I myself would have a very difficult time trying to select exactly who should be in the Hall of Fame from this team. There were some great players and some outstanding individuals, but I thank the committee for that. When I came to Lorraine, and I hear so many people from Lorraine St. Mary's. Somehow or another, they miss me. I was there for two years and we had great teams. And I really and truthfully say I enjoyed the camaraderie that I learned and gained from being in Lorraine. I'm not from Lorraine, but I do remember the fact that they accepted me into Lorraine as one of their coaches. I also picked up during that time Besides learning how to coach, learning how to teach, a wife. My wife is from Lorraine, the beautiful Patricia Lukanik, who's not here tonight because she's at some really great wedding from her family. But we've been married 45 years, four children and four grandchildren. So I'm grateful for that to you people from Lorraine. When I first pick this job up, one of the things that you have to do is try to get a staff. And all of us who coach know that you cannot go anywhere without a staff. And I was very fortunate in picking up four, five very, very good coaches. Ralph Pisanelli was one of my coaches. Ralph, where are you? Right here. Okay, Ralph. Bobby Walsh, who's in your Hall of Fame started his coaching career with us at Clearview. Bobby. There's Bobby Walsh, one of your Hall of Famers. We also had a guy by the name of Robert Muschetti and Gino Gioia. That's four Italians plus Bobby. <laughs> and we're sometimes referred to as Garibaldi's Raiders. <laughs> this team is very deserving of what you are, are, are presenting them with this evening. And I always have been an individual who tried to teach, as all the coaches in this world and all the players here know, dedication, dedication, attitude, and sacrifice. If you're going to be a team, you've got to sacrifice. One of the first things we did was try to talk to the fact that no one could point to another person on a team and say, you didn't get that done. In fact, just the opposite. I would not tolerate it. One of the things that occurred that I thought was very, very important is that when we pointed to these people, we said, your fault, no one else's. I don't care who you are and what you did. You can't point to your friend. Do your job. They will do theirs, and we'll be a team. That's what makes a team, dependent on other people besides you. One person said tonight that football is one of the greatest team sports, and I agree with him 100%. And we did that. We really would not accept anybody saying that someone failed. One illustration of that is that we did not have a center. We only had 28 people, so it was not very, very, very lucrative to go around looking for people with center. So I took a tackle from the previous team, and I said, you're going to be my center. After his reluctance, he said, I'll be your center. And I said to him before he did that, remember this, the game starts with a center. Nothing can go unless you have a center. If the quarterback fumbles the ball, it's the center's fault. 
if the, uh, the quarterback pulls out too quick, it's the center's fault. And I want you to be a man enough to know, if you're going to play that center position, that you're responsible for all those items from everybody. And he accepted it, and I appreciate your Walt Sestelli. Another thing that I believe that people have to do is make these sacrifices, and I use that word, and I'll continue to use that word. We had a young man who had played N the year before, was looking forward to coming back and becoming an N, and was a nice, tall, lanky young man. When I called him into my office to tell him he's going to be moved to offensive tackle. What a blow to an eagle who thought there were going to be an N. What's even more alarming about it, he only weighed about 142 pounds. But we wanted to do the one thing that we all coaches talk about, and I believe in. Get the best people on your team on the field at the same time. You can't go by having a second string person sitting there next to you when you're getting your fanny kicked out of the field. That person should be on the field. And this team made that sacrifice. And Mr. Kane, I remember those days. I'm sure you did too. And he was a great offensive tackle for us. <laughs> Last but certainly not least of my examples, so we had a man who was a great end. Should have been in your Hall of Fame many, many, many times. He was a little All-American after he left Clearview, three years at Wittenberg. He's in a Hall of Fame in Canadian football. But with us, he was just another end, who I immediately turned to into a strong safety. Strong safety, in this day and age of terminology, plays to the strong side of the field with the tight end. But in our system, we unbalanced our def defense and we put him over on the one side. He didn't like it because everybody ran away from him. And that's exactly what we as coaches thought was going to happen. And they ran away from Jim Warden. Our biggest difficulty from Jim Warden was that when he was not in the action too often, that he would grab or go after the opposing quarterback and yell at him because they wouldn't run in his direction. But Jim Warden made that sacrifice. I can mention many more on this team. And that's the type of thing that makes a champion. And that's what these people are. I am really, really appreciative of what you've done for this team, finally recognizing them. And I also want to teach one more cliche or whatever you want to say in coaching that we really and truthfully believe in. I personally believe in it 100%. You have these young men for a short period of life, a small window in their whole life. Do the best you can to teach them what this world's all about, what life's all about, what teamwork's all about, and what sacrifice is all about. If you can't help them, and believe me, there are people you can't help. Don't hurt them. Don't do something that hurts them for the rest of their lives if you can't help them. Pass them along to other people who may see something you don't see and have communication with that person you can't communicate with. Don't hurt them. Help them. Thank you again for this great honor. I'm speaking for the team because I know they're all humbled and they're all really enjoying this night. And I want to tell you how much I appreciate the Lorraine County Hall of Fame for all the things that you're doing for athletics in this community. Thank you. John McCaslin. We have certificates here from the hall in the name of the uh, coaches and each of the individual players. Not all of them are here, so it'll take me a second to get through. Plus, I'm not used to speaking after the coach, because after the speak got 
coach gets done speaking, you shut up, buckle up, and go smack somebody upside the head. <laughs> so I never, I never got to talk after he did before. <laughs> uh, this is certificate for you, Coach oh, Amadio. Thank you. And this is for Mr. Joy and Mr. Cincinnati. Can you get those to them? Okay. I'm sorry, I know you can't. I hear the name is. Uh, do you want me to, to announce names or yes. just hand the singer up? Okay. Uh, for Coach uh, Pisanelli. Thank you. Okay. For uh, Harry Battlers. Harry. Step up here so they can see you. A bunch of players step up here and get their certificate so we don't have to go looking for you. In fact, Coach, one, one time I read an article several years after we graduated where Coach says we weren't particularly big or we weren't particularly fast. And I hope you've noticed, Coach, we're, we're slower than we used to be, but we don't qualify that for that particularly big anymore. <laughs> okay, Ron Brown, Ron's not here. Sid, but Sid, Sid Butchko. Give them to me, I'll, 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 I'll. Okay. Uh, Kenny Campo. Is Ken here tonight? No. I don't think Kim was. Okay. Uh, this is Richard Chaplin, was a team member, but Richard isn't here this evening. Dan, Dan Devich. Did Dan show up? He said he was going to be here, but I don't think he, did he show? Okay, there he is. I hadn't seen you tonight, Dan. Uh, Dan's older brother Mike, who wasn't able to be here this evening. Uh, Mike DeBisa, who was not able to be here this, meeting, this evening, he's in, in Oregon, lives in Oregon, couldn't get away. Richard Ziak, Ziak. He's, he's not here. Okay, uh, Larry Gendix, I know Larry is here this evening. Uh, Bill Hill, who came in for Arizona to be here. Dick Kane. Dick Kane. Larry Johnson, who couldn't be here this evening. Uh, I haven't seen him, but somebody told me he was here. Don, uh, Dan Kozlowski, stand here. Oh, okay, I guess not. Uh, Tom Clear isn't here either, is he? Thomas Clear, and he wasn't able to make it this evening. Is he? Tom Clear. Uh, Richard Connewall. Is Richard here? I, I saw him earlier. Richard, we have him. We have him. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Gary Novak, who lives a few hours away from me in California, but he lives closer to Hollywood, so he had better things to do. Dave Pastor. Gil Placencia. Ron Poyle. Ernie Pratt, he's not here. He also lives in uh, California, about an hour from me. Dennis Provenza. Mike Serfozo. Walt Sestelli. Jim Sheehan. Larry Zepp, who didn't make it this evening. Bill Thomas, who is in, in London, so he couldn't make it. Uh, John Thompson, who is not here this evening. Chet Uzinski. And Jim Warden. It's in here someplace. Yeah, it's in here someplace. 
Yeah, I've got it here. Oh, here it is, Richard. Here it is. Here it is. Here's for Richard. That, that is it, sir. You got any more words? No, I just have one short thing to uh, say. Uh, years and years ago, we, we probably all read in, a, in a, the famous uh, classic, Look Homeward Angel, uh, a little statement that more or less said you can never come home again. Well, you know, perhaps it's uh, rather foolish of me to argue with a genius such as Thomas Wolfe, but he was wrong. You can come home again, and it's a good thing to do. All right, that concludes the uh, awards uh, portion of our program. Also concludes my uh, portion. And I again thank uh, the Cavs for the opportunity to earn my keep tonight. And with that, let me introduce one more time President Bill Stout. Thank you, Ron. That was just a great round of speeches made by all of the inductees. It was really amazing hearing all about them. I'd like to thank Ron Bacalar for, after having sit, sat on a bench for so long, he came in and did an outstanding job of emceeing. Bob DiBiasio, our guest speaker, very entertaining. Bob, thank you very much. To Dennis and the staff at the uh, party center here, it was an outstanding meal, and we appreciate your service and efforts. To Bob Lisicki, who is our banquet chairman, producer, slash coordinator, slash four minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. <laughs> to program book coordinators Ted Driscoll and Craig Snodgrass, and to all the committee members who have made this a memorable evening, we appreciate your coming especially. We encourage you to take a look in your program book and see the information on the Lorraine Sports Hall of Fame Museum, and also note that we have a website <laughs> where you can look up information on all past inductees. We have a golf outing coming up in July at uh, Fox Creek. If you're interested in sponsoring or participating, the information is also in your booklet on pages, uh, I'm not sure which pages. So thank you all again for coming, and Reverend Newby will now lead us in a benediction. Truly, this has been an extraordinary evening. May the Lord continue to smile on each of the honorees and the inductees this evening. Will you please bow your heads? And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance unto you and give you peace. Amen. The social activity in the far corner is now open. This has been a production of Lorraine City Schools TV20 WLCS.